Okay, welcome. Thanks everyone who's joining us online. I'm here with Shannon Hayes, who's a data expert with the International Organization for Migration. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, Sh Shannon. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, could you just tell us a little bit about your background and what you do with IOM? Um, well, I am, I've worked in humanitarian response and emergency response for over 15 years around the world. And now I work with IOM's Global Data Institute, which is one of the primary data collection and analysis uh, functions in emergencies. And I also work with UNICEF's Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility. And they are tasked with organizing all of the stakeholders who are working in emergencies um, to, to coordinate strategy and to figure out who's doing what where to make sure that services are provided. Now, child protection and emergency services include anything that um, our partners do to prevent or respond to situations of abuse, neglect, exploitation, or violence against children in situations of uh, natural disasters or conflict or, or anything like that. Cool. Thanks very much. So that's really super interesting. So are there any specific challenges um, when you're working with data, for instance, surrounding children? Yes, absolutely. So one of the key functions of the child protection area of responsibility in an emergency setting is to help come up with a strategy on where are we going to work? Who do we need to help? What kind of help do they need? How many people are they? And therefore, how much is it going to cost? And to do that, we need to be able to classify locations of displacement according to the severity of need for response, because we could end up in a situation where, for example, like in Ethiopia, we have 3,000 displacement locations. We, can't, we don't have the capacity to respond everywhere, so we do need to classify them in order to prioritize where we are going to be sending our response. Now, issues with with the uh, emergency response in terms of data is that we often have to make strategic decisions with incomplete and sometimes contradictory data, but we need to move. And so we need to make do with what we've got and what we can get in a lot of circumstances. And it becomes especially difficult with child protection data because child protection incidents are often taboo subjects. So we're thinking about you know, situations of abuse, situations of violence, um, and, when we collect data, we cannot go door to door asking people if they are abusing their children for obvious reasons, right? They're, that's very unethical. And um, even if we did collect data like that, it would it would be underreported. So it would make it look like the problem is way less uh, pre prevalent than it is in reality. And so without having direct data on what is happening to children, the challenge then becomes how do we prioritize where to go when we don't know what's happening to those children? Yeah, fantastic. That's super interesting. So it seems like the problem of picking proxy indicators and proxy measures is super, super important there. I mean, could you tell us a little bit about, um, given the challenges you've just explained, what kinds of proxy measures you've used and uh, the kinds of arguments that have been put forward for or against different kinds of proxy measures? Yeah, that'd be great. I, I would like to share my screen with you, if I if I may. Please just go ahead. Should be should be all right to do. So, so you you said it um, you said it well. We do use proxy indicators when we are trying to figure out where it is in the in the country that we are working in, where we need to respond for our strategy. And to do that, we look at this analysis framework. And so these are the assumptions, the causes and underlying factors are those assumptions that the situation of situational factors that lead to higher child protection risk. So you'll have things like conflict of, and violence and disasters. So unsafe physical environments, for example, will increase risks to children. Barriers to goods and services will also increase risk to children. So for example, if you have a family that doesn't have enough to eat, then there's a much bigger risk that children will be taken out of school and either forced to beg, which puts them at risk, or forced to work, which puts them at risk. So there's all the different types of risks that are associated um, to having to not having your basic needs met. And then we have norms and values and legal frameworks and rules of law. I won't go into those. 
So those underlying factors lead to those child protection risks that you see in the second row, which are dangers and injuries, physical and emotional maltreatment, gender-based violence, et cetera. And this is where we end up having a big um, issue in terms of data for child protection is that we cannot collect data on you know, abuse and gender-based violence and any data that we might want to collect on mental health or children associated with armed groups or unaccompanied and separated children need to be used, um, need to be collected with specific data collection methodologies and a lot of different types of training. So we often can't collect that either. So that leaves us only dangers and injuries and child labor as direct data. So what we do is we take those proxy indicators from the underlying factors in order to understand where the risk is highest for children. And then we look at those locations where the basic services are already covered because if the risks are high, but the services are already there, that's not where we need to prioritize, right? And the way that we come up with this is that we do a severity scale to help us classify all of the locations. And we look at um, the underlying factors you can see on the left. So for examples, percentages of an IDP is an internally displaced person. So someone who's been displaced within their own country. So for, for the percentage of children out of school or the percentage of uh, people in high risk shelters like under tarpaulins or the percentages of people who have negative coping mechanisms because they're hungry, we look at indicators like that. And then we assign thresholds of the percentage of the people who are experiencing those problems to come to be able to classify on a scale of zero to six, where does the, this um, displacement site rank in terms of severity? Now, when we're looking at those thresholds, these are not standardized thresholds around the world. We really need to look at the data to figure out what our thresholds should be. So we'll, we'll come up with a threshold at first and then see how it looks when we come up with the results for each site. We don't want all of the sites to end up in one class, in one classification category, because then that's not helping us at all. It's not helping us to prioritize where to go if all of them are a number three or all of them are a number four, right? So we adjust the thresholds to make sure that we're spreading the all of the sites out across the, the gamut of our severity scale so we can actually really prioritize where we're going to go. And so looking at these indicators, these are these correspond to those underlying factors and then the basic services that you can see there. And this might look quite complicated, but it's actually all done in Excel. We don't have fancy softwares in these emergency settings. And what it does is that it then helps us to come up with a map like this, where it can say, okay, these are the locations where we really need to prioritize where we're going to respond as a community, you know, in implementing child protection response services. And it helps also with operational actors who are like, okay, well, maybe we need to set up a sub base here and, you know, figuring out distances and, and, and uh, potential barriers to access, accessing the sites, et cetera. That's really super, super interesting. So one thing that kind of struck me when you were talking is that you're taking a particular classification model, right? Or you take an initial classification model and then you revise this classification model uh, on the basis of, you know, once you've had a look at how it classifies. Um, I was just kind of curious. So the classification, this process of revision, are you just looking at making sure that you're classifying kind of the right number of sites into your right percentage of sites into the different severities? Or are there kind of additional constraints that make you classify in different, different ways? That's a very good question. One of the constraints that we have is humanitarian access. And so if this is a dangerous location where we can't go, do we classify it as severe when we can't actually get there to help people? So there are constraints like that. There's constraints like, where did the data come from? We really need to think about the accuracy and the reliability of the data. How long ago was it collected? Does, it, does this data represent the current situation? And so it's not a perfect system. It's a system that helps us move. And that is, that's what we need to do. If we waited for the perfect information, we would just be sitting there forever and people would be dying, right? So the, the objective is to get enough information in order to make decisions. And when we do end up with a map like this and we classify it, because 
you know, working predominantly with proxy indicators is an imperfect system. We then do a sanity check. So we'll contact people who are working in the various locations and say, hey, this is the result that we, we managed to get through our severity classification. Does this make sense to you? And sometimes people will say, well, actually, I think that this site is actually more severe than what it's categorized there, and we will change it. So there's there's also a sanity check step at the end. We're not just relying on the numbers because, as I said, the proxies are great, but they're not perfect. Cool. Super interesting. Thanks very much. Um, so what would you like to see in the humanitarian data space moving forward? That's a very good question. One of the things that I would really like to see would be that the people who we are providing services to, it would it would be really helpful if they had access to, te to technology so that they could better represent themselves in terms of data um, on, on needs and also self-referral to child protection services, et cetera. And that would increase their voice in how we do emergency response. It would increase the speed in which we have the data in order to make decisions, and it would reduce the cost significantly. Because at the moment, we need to go to all of those 3,000 displacement sites to interview and collect that data. And so I think that it would be great, you know, in a world sometime in the future when everyone had access to the technology in order to better represent themselves in these situations. Cool. Thanks very much. That's really super interesting. So thank you very much for taking the time to talk today. It's been a, a real pleasure talking to you, Shannon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.